The Rattel is a new micro FPV camera recently released from Cadex that has an impressive list of advertised features, including a large sensor, 8 millisecond latency, wide input voltage range, switchable between NTSC, PAL, 69, and 4x3. They also boast extreme low light performance, all while only weighing 8 grams, which is actually 8.298 grams. For all you beautiful people out there, OCD on weight. On paper, this sounds almost too good to be true, which is why I've chosen this as my first bench camera test, which will include raw electrical video latency testing, low light testing, along with some other essential tests on this camera. Recursion Labs. For science. I've designed and built this rudimentary camera test circuit, which allows us to easily connect both camera and video transmitters to the board for testing. This includes tap points for an oscilloscope, as well as a button to light up an LED box when testing camera latency. More on that later. The first test we will perform is a simple power consumption test, so we can see how much juice this camera will suck from your battery when powered up waiting to fly. With only the camera connected to my test board, my bench power supply is set to 12 volts to emulate a 3 cell battery nominal voltage. The load from the camera at 12 volts is 70 milliamp, which means the camera is consuming about 0.8 watts of power. Let's crank the voltage to 30 to see how it responds. 28 milliamps, which is roughly also 0.8 watts of power as before, indicating the camera power regulation is efficient. You're safe to run this thing on 8S, if you want to. When doing this much in such a small package, heat can be an issue. Let's switch to... Thermal Vision! Within 5 minutes, the camera slowly rises to a stable 67 degrees Celsius, which should make it hot to touch, but not hot enough to require a skin graft. It's worth mentioning that the metal outer casing of the camera is acting as a heat sink to help dissipate heat. And even without airflow, I wouldn't be concerned about these temperatures as long as you're not planning on removing the case. To be able to test and demonstrate data on the low light capability, I have a digital lux meter, which is used to measure the amount of light on the sensor surface. We can then determine how much light is required for the camera to read the numbers on the meter. This test is not perfect since my light source is less than ideal for this type of test, but should be good enough to get a general idea. This was actually very hard to perform, since it was difficult to get the light low enough in my lab area to be too dark for the camera not to see my lux meter, which in itself is a great sign. With some fiddling with the light source, the light required is about 0.5 to 1 lux to see the lux meter, and about 3 without too much ISO noise, which is quite low. The moon by itself at full brightness is only about 0.3 lux, so it would be difficult to fly in those conditions. However, this would be more than sufficient for dusk or dawn flying, or flying in an area with a little bit of outdoor lighting. Low light is great, but being able to deal with 100,000 lux of direct sunlight is super important for day flying. To emulate this, I use my 5000 lumen flashlight, which can generate the equivalent lux of the sun at a 9 centimeter distance from the camera. With the light dead center, the surrounding area is dark, but in any corner of the screen, the rest of the image is perfectly viewable, and the transition period from full bright to dark is quite fast. This is definitely an extreme test, and I would conclude that this camera will have no problems dealing with sunlight. At one point during the light test, it appeared the camera crashed for a second and restarted, but I could not reproduce this again easily. This may or may not be an issue, but it was a bit concerning. Using a standard camera testing image on my lab monitor, you can observe the color accuracy, with a clear outer fisheye effect with a reasonably sized center sweet spot with an acceptable aspect ratio. You can judge based on this if this is suitable to your personal preference. We will now conduct the camera recursion test, which adds absolutely no value to these tests outside of making me giggle every time I do it. Now for the latency test. To measure the raw latency of the camera, I have placed the camera into a box to isolate all outside light. The video output of the camera is tapped with my oscilloscope, where you can view the raw analog signal with clear frame separation on the scope. An all black output shows up as a lower overall voltage, where all white would be a higher overall voltage. I have a push button on my test board which supplies voltage to the LEDs turning them on. The path from the button to the LED is also tapped with my oscilloscope, so that the voltage spike when the button is pressed can be clearly measured. The difference on the oscilloscope for when the voltage spikes when the button is pressed to when the analog video signal spikes from the bright LED light will be the camera latency. This methodology is significantly more accurate than measuring the light spike from an output to an LCD screen because the pixel transition and frame latency from an LCD screen adds about 6 to 22 milliseconds of variable latency to the test. On my oscilloscope, the bottom blue trace represents an all black analog signal output with the gaps of the delay between each frame. The top yellow line is the current zero voltage of the button output. Now for our first sample. Okay, there's the start point. So we have 4, 8, 16, 20. So that line's 20 and 23 milliseconds of latency. That's quite large. Let's take another sample. 20 milliseconds, roughly, maybe 19. 22 milliseconds. 22 milliseconds. Um, 25 milliseconds. 
20 milliseconds. Oof, that is a little bit more than 30 milliseconds. This test was repeated hundreds of times on various settings, including switching all camera settings to manual, disabling wide dynamic range, and anything else I could change, with the latency always averaging around 24 milliseconds on NTSC. Testing PAL was super interesting. The latency was always static at 20 milliseconds through hundreds of tests, which means PAL is more stable and consistent to use on this camera if you have the option of using this mode and are okay with the reduced frame rate. Testing the time the LED turns off to when the screen goes black, which tests more than just raw camera latency, had more than double the latency at 32 to 50 milliseconds on NTSC. 20 plus milliseconds may not seem like a lot, and on its own it might not be since we're talking about 1.5 frames of video. However, when looking at all of the latency from sticks to eyes, it is definitely a significant amount in the overall chain. For racers or those who enjoy the flight characteristics of lower latencies, this camera might not be for you. The fact Caddx advertises this as a low latency camera with only 8 milliseconds of latency doesn't sit right with me, as this appears to not even be a stretch of the truth. With all that said, if you're looking for a light micro camera that can be used without sacrificing image qualities for both outdoors and low light flying and are willing to accept a bit of latency, this camera might be right for you. If their latency claims were as advertised or better, this camera would be an easy winner, assuming it is stable. I would like to thank Rotorev and Mississauga for lending me their floor model of this camera, which allowed me to perform these independent tests. Expect more of these soon.